Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, we hope uh, you have enjoyed your coffee and tea. This is the last panel and then the cocktail camp, so uh, we will try to do it quickly, but uh, informative. And um, uh, the, the first speaker is not present right now. He's Tom Hammer. He's the CEO of uh, NOPA, uh, the, the American Association. And we are going then to watch the video that he sent uh, with uh, his speech. Greetings, this is Tom Hammer. I'm president of the National Oil Seed Processors Association. I'm pleased to join your conference today, even though it has to be via video. In the time that I have with you today, I'd like to talk about some of the latest developments in the U.S. oil seed crushing industry. But first, a little bit about NOPA. NOPA is a national trade association representing the U.S. soybean, canola, flaxseed, safflower, and sunflower seed crushing industries. Our 12 solvent extractor members operate a total of 60 soybean processing plants, five soft seed processing facilities across 21 states. Our members produce meal and oil used in human food, animal feed, renewable fuel, and industrial applications. Collectively, our members crush 95% of all soybeans that are processed in the United States. When you crush a soybean, you get 80% meal and 20% oil. 98% of the meal goes to feeding animals, predominantly poultry and swine. 2% is used for food and industrial applications. The 20% oil yields 56% for food and feed ingredients, food and, and, and food ingredients, such as frying and baking, vegetable oils, salad oils, etc. The remaining 44% is used in renewable fuels such as biodiesel and renewable diesel. As you may know, NOPA members publish their aggregated crush data to the marketplace on or about the 15th of each month. Since we represent 95% of the beans processed in the United States, this report is viewed as very significant to traders, analysts, and others that are involved in our industry. If you look at the last 20 years, you see a steady increase in crush volume by our members, and this was before the advent of renewable diesel. 20 years ago, we processed about 1.5 billion bushels of beans, and last year we crushed just a little over 2.1 billion. So we've had a 20-year steady increase of crush, capa uh, crush capacity and crush volumes over the years. In the last five years, our uh, crush increases have been operating above that trend line. Let's talk a little bit about crush margins for a moment. We can't talk about individual members' crush margins because that's proprietary, but we can use uh, public uh, data. And the Chicago Mercantile Exchange does uh, publish synthetic uh, crush margins. Historically, when our members crush, soybeans, 65% of their margin comes from soybean meal, and 35% comes from oil. With oil only being 20%, that suggests that oil has a little higher value. As there have been discussion about demand, rising demand for oil, for renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel, and the like, the crush margin last year at one point reached 50-50, where we were getting a signal that it was about even for crushing for meal or for oil. 
as the processors look at these market signals, they have to decide what they, what they're really crushing for. And it's that signal that we're getting to crush for more oil that's that's driving the increase in capacity in the United States. I'll come back to that in just a minute. As we do crush for oil, we're going to get an equal, we're going to get that 80% meal. And we have to move that soybean meal or uh, this uh, plant expansion that we're talking about is, is not going to work. But a little bit about the, the plant expansions. There's, there's about 20 new or expanded facilities that we expect to come online between now and 2025. NOPA members are a large part of that. They're investing their money in expanding their plants and in opening new plants. For example, ADM has a new facility in Spirit Wood, North Dakota. Bungie is expanding two facilities in Destrehan, Louisiana, in Cairo, Illinois. THS uh, is a is expanding an existing plant in Mankato, Minnesota. Consolidated Grain and Barge is, is uh, opening a new plant in Castleton, North Dakota. Ag Processing is opening a new plant in David City, Nebraska. Cargill is opening a new plant along the river in Missouri. Non-NOPA members have also been announcing new facilities, and most recently, Shell Rock in Shell Rock, Iowa is now operational. And there are several more to come online between now and the fall of 2025. And even more, we're seeing new announcements in the paper on an ongoing basis for, for new facilities. Well, that begs the question. With the 20 new facilities or expanded facilities, a possible 30% increase in capacity, are there enough soybeans in the United States to supply this additional growth? And the answer to that is yes. Where will it come from? Well, there'll be additional acres possibly where, where soybean growers will, 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 will take acres from such traditional crop, row crops as, as corn and wheat, for example. Uh, increased yields are happening on, on an annual basis. And of course, this is dictated a lot by weather, which those of you in South America know, know what I'm talking about. But there's also, you know, new improved agronomic pro uh, practices by soybean farmers. And there's new uh, crop protection products as well as, as new advanced technology and seeds. And there's, uh, there's research going on on higher oil yielding soybeans right now. Uh, I don't see um, the supply being uh, met by Im increased imports, but on the export side, as you may know, 50% of the beans that are grown in the United States are processed here at home, and 50% are sent for, uh, to the export market for processing elsewhere. So there is a supply of beans that could be bid away from the export market to be used uh, to supply this, this new uh, expansion and, and, and new plants. But soybean meal becomes a, a, a limiting factor. Our members can store, store soybean oil, but that we, we know how to do that with good inventory practices, but there's, there's no desire to, so, to store soybean meal. It, it's difficult to store. It's, it, by volume, it's a lot of it's a lot of weight, and it, it could go out of grade. So when we uh, when when the soybean meal comes out of the plant, we, we need we need to find a, a home for it. We need to market it. We're not we're not going to store it. So we we uh, operate our plants on a twenty four seven basis, and if the soybean meal isn't moved, it's going to affect run rates. And then that that that'll affect uh, the these new plant and, and expansions negatively, quite negatively. So, the uh, where would the soybean meal be sold, for example? 
Well, we, there could be higher inclusion rates uh, for meat and poultry rations. Uh, it could be substituted for other proteins such as uh, DDGs, uh, canola meal, synthetic uh, amino acids. Uh, it could be used uh, to, to enhance uh, exports of U.S. chicken and pork products, for example. And then, of course, there could be enhanced soybean meal export opportunities vis-a-vis -vis our competitors uh, in South America and, and other origins as, as we uh, have an opportunity to price this meal more competitively and perhaps remain in the export market for a, a longer window of time. The bottom line is uh, there is going to be a rising demand from renewable fuels, particularly renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuels. There is going to be additional capacity, potentially as much as 30% or more between now and 2025. There will be available soybeans for crushing for this uh, enhanced new capacity. And there will be uh, additional supplies of soybean meal that will be competitively priced that must find its way into the domestic and the international marketplace. So in conclusion, NOPA members and even non-NOPA members are trying to be part of the solution to, re to uh, supply this increased demand for all segments, be it food, feed, or fuel. And soybean farmers will be doing their part to make sure that there's adequate supplies of soybeans for the future. So I thank you very much for allowing my time with you today, and I wish you a very uh, successful conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, for Mr. Hammer. And now we are going to listen to Andrew Yolster, whom uh, many of you already know. Uh, he, he is head of oils for Cargill South America, and uh, we welcome him uh, uh, with his speech. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Ciara Sahir and the International Sunflower Association for inviting me. And uh, to all our illustrious uh, visitors from India, uh, Sandeep, Bahoria, and, and the whole delegation. So great to see you again. And uh, okay, so we'll try to talk a little bit about uh, soybean oil markets. But I have to say it's impossible to talk about soybean oil in Argentina without talking about soybean oil in other places. So please forgive me if I overlap a little bit with what you're gonna say later about Brazil. Um, or other presentations about other oils. So, okay, first, uh, kind of a 10,000 uh, meter view of, of oil markets. Uh, Tom Hammer just mentioned it. Uh, what is happening in our markets? The, the, the main factor is a huge growth of demand in vegetable oils in, in the US uh, for basically renewable diesel, but also uh, uh, sustainable a aviation fuel and, and obviously biodiesel, which continues. This is resulting, as he also said, in a huge growth of um, uh, crushing uh, in, in the US, 32%, 33% for North America. That's the US and uh, Canada combined. I have another slide with more detail uh, in, in a minute. And at the same time, regulations are changing both in the US and in Europe, uh, pushing for more sustainable feedstocks, used cooking oil, tallow, cover crops, and so on. And uh, the, uh, Europe is already moving away from palm oil, and certain states in, in Europe are moving away from soy-based biofuels. We have uh, already France and Austria, which have uh, stopped using as of January 2023, uh, and I think uh, Belgium will join them as of June. 
so you know that is uh, affecting obviously uh, going forward demand for soybean oil. This is just uh, uh, renewable diesel growth in the U.S. Uh, if you take the uh, projection for 2024, that equates to roughly 16 and a half, 17 million tons of feedstock. That's not all soybean oil, as you see in the smaller graph to the right. Uh, soybean oil participation in the total amount of feedstock should be uh, reducing, but obviously it is a growth in, in demand. No? Uh, here is a more detail about the plants. So uh, Tom mentioned that uh, mentioned a few of these, but you can see in the U.S. Well, these are announced plants. There could be more that uh, have not made the official announcement, or maybe made it recently, and I did not pick it up. So we have 18 uh, new crushing plants in the U.S. and four, uh, sorry, in North America, 14 of those in the U.S.A. Uh, and uh, four for Canada. And as you see on the little graph on the right, uh, that would take North America's share of the total crush capacity in, in the continent uh, from 32 to 39 percent. This is just, uh, I, I, I like this chart. I saw it in a SMP presentation, so I asked if, if I could share it, but the, the flows of, this is the flow of used cooking oil. And it just shows, uh, you know, the, the extent of it and the origins and the destinations. The U.S. is still uh, a net origin for used cooking oil, but soon will be consuming, should be consuming all of that domestically and become a net importer. And this is uh, a, a, also a graph from S&P, which I thought was interesting. And, and you see clearly there in the red area how they're phasing out palm oil. And soybean oil at the bottom also is gradually going to be phased out. We have a little more time, but uh, uh, th there is, you know, a push because of sustainability issues, uh, mostly tied to deforestation in, in, in Brazil and some other places, but uh, mostly there. Uh, and uh, so certain states are trying to uh, avoid the use of it. And eventually, uh, rape oil could be phased out as well, but that seems you know, far-fetched because it will be difficult to, to replace. Um, in the recent publications uh, about uh, biodiesel, you have uh, annex of the RED, the Re Renewable Energy Directive of Europe, has an Annex A and an Annex B. Annex B contains um, used cooking oil, tallow, and as of December also cover crops. So, you know, a lot of people looking into Camelina, Caninata, and, and, and Crambe in, in Brazil uh, as uh, potential feedstocks. And Annex A is all the other, let's say, wastes, uh, which is still in development. No? So if we zoom into markets uh, in, in, in more recent times, we, we, we have an incredible amount of uncertainty, uh, one of which was just recently clarified in Brazil, which is uh, the Brazilian mandate that has now been announced uh, that it will move from B10 to B12 in April. Uh, but Indonesia is, you know, moving to B35, and, uh, you know, they, they have a possibility of growing further, or eventually, if, you know, if markets get tight, they could reduce as well. So that is always, you know, a, a sword hanging over our heads when you get uh, extremely bullish or, or friendly oils, uh, you know, uh, that, that is always there. Uh, it's at hand to uh, our governments, you know, to, to reduce demand. Uh, the RVO in, in the U.S., the Renewable Volume Obligation, that is, um, is uh, that was announced in December. As you all recall, it was pretty disappointing to markets. Uh, uh, futures crashed at the time, and uh, it's in a common period today, and, and that obligation did not consider the growth in crush that we've been talking about, this 32, 33% increase. So if they don't grow, you know, that, that would leave uh, the U.S. with excess capacity. Uh, so everybody believes that uh, they will probably leave what was announced in December for 23 and 24 unchanged, but uh, will leave 25 forward open, 
uh, and eventually uh, leave room for growth there uh, according to their production. Meanwhile, the U.S. is importing a lot of oil, uh, EPA-compliant oil, but not as oil, as biodiesel or as renewable diesel. It's because oil has a 19.1% import duty in the U.S. and uh, biofuels have a lower import duty. Uh, we are exporting EPA-compliant uh, soybean oil to Europe, for example, uh, uh, Canada, and they're converting it into biofuels and exporting it to the U.S. Um, import duties in India, uh, our previous uh, speakers talked about that. That is always uh, something that we have to watch because it does affect, you know, demand of one oil versus another. And more recently, weather, especially in Argentina, you are aware of, uh, of the drought that, that, that we've gone through, the worst in, in history, I believe. Uh, highest temperatures ever. Uh, if anyone of you arrived a week before this, this meeting, you would have been met with uh, 40 Celsius degrees in March, something that we have never seen before. Um, but also, we and talking of which, uh, you know, the impact has been huge. Now, we were initially thinking of a soybean crop of 50 million tons, roughly, and our estimation today is around 23. Some people are talking about less, 21, 22, but harvest is just starting, so we'll, we'll soon find out. Uh, record abandonment, somewhere around 15% of the acreage will not be collected because it's just not enough to pay for the cost of, uh, of the harvest. And talking of weather, also, Europe is going through a drought. Uh, we are moving from a, uh, a Niña, three years of La Niña, really, which is what has been causing the, is the dry weather or drier than normal weather lately in, in, in Argentina, uh, to a Niño, which should be good for us, but could be bad for Malaysia and Indonesia. And uh, as you know, 90% or more of Palm oil is, is produced in that area, and, and that could have a huge impact on oils as we go forward, no? and maybe 2024. And then you've all heard of the special forex schemes, the dollar soja in, in Argentina. That also is impacting. We don't know when the government is going to come up with one of these or not, and that impacts farmer selling absolutely. Uh, there has been... At, no farmer selling in local currency since we had the last dollar soja scheme in December. They have sold unpriced, they have sold in dollars, but no, nobody has sold in pesos. And it makes sense. I mean, they're, they're just waiting for, that to, for, for the next one to come. And uh, that is, you know, something that we right now don't know, and uh, it affects our decisions if to crush or not. Because if you, if you crush in, in Argentina, you sooner or later you need to export your goods or you, or you plug your plant. If you export them, you need to uh, bring in the dollars and turn them into local currency in uh, 15 days at the latest. And that will put you long pesos. And that is not something you want to be uh, with 100% you know, inflation a year. So uh, the, your only, the only thing you can do if, uh, if you don't get a dollar scheme and, no, and the uh, farmer will not sell to you in pesos. So if you get pesos from the central bank against your exports, but nobody's selling to you in pesos any, any grains, then there's not much you can do with them. So that is something that uh, affects our, our decision making uh, hugely. And then, of course, the macro situation, since uh, the Silicon Valley Bank affair and, uh, and Credit Suisse and now Deutsche Bank and so on and so on, luckily this week, markets seem to have found some support and stability, but uh, last week was a, a nightmare because of, of this situation. Ah, uh, China. I, I, uh, I think I skipped China. Uh, and the uh, change in policy. This is a mobility index, which is kind of like the Google uh, system, no? How much uh, it has to do with, with traffic and uh, 
Uh, and as you see, the, the blue area, that is the spread between the same date this year and in 2022. And you can see it's picking up quite a bit, and especially since China changed the COVID policy. And that, uh, as we all know, uh, affects demand uh, importantly in, in China. No? That, uh, uh, when people were at home, uh, demand crashed. Uh, I think uh, we estimate that consumption of vegetables, not only in China, but everywhere, at home is about 50% of what it is um, uh, when you go to a restaurant, no? so it's important. So what can we expect uh, for premiums uh, in Argentina? Uh, so I, I will not give any numbers or ranges like our friend Dorab does and so on, but uh, let's just put things in context. Uh, well, we just mentioned Argentina lost more than 50% of the crop. But last year was also a smaller crop. Last year, we only lost 20% of the crop. So if we compare this year with last year, we lost 17 million. Last year was around 40, some say 41. Uh, and this year, if we take 23, that's 17 million tons less. But our crush is going to be down maybe 8 to 8.5 million tons. And that is because we've reduced soybean exports by almost 5 million tons. Uh, I would say the only beans that will be exported are those that were already registered, had export registrations uh, during uh, the last uh, dollar soja scheme. Uh, and then we've increased uh, or we're projecting imports to grow tremendously. No? We, I'd say uh, five to six million tons more than last year, mainly from Paraguay. Yet last year they had a very small crop because they were hit by weather problems. And, um, and this year, we should have at least 5 million from Paraguay and over 2 million from Brazil, uh, and then Bolivia as well. Uruguay was also hit very hard this year by, by the drought, so they will not be exporting uh, anything to Argentina. Um, Brazil will crush maybe 4 million tons more, so they, they will help out for this, let's say, slowdown in oil production we will have in Argentina. But then, of course, we just mentioned there, there are going to be 12. And that means, as of April, around 80,000 tons more per month of soybean oil consumption than, you know, with, than we had with B10. So their exportable surplus uh, will be reduced by almost, I would say, one to one with their increase in, in, in crush. So Brazil will not be helping too much in the export markets compared to last year. And then another thing to take into account is what happened in the US, because as you re recall, last year and the previous year as well, we had really, really low premiums in Argentina. We hit 2,000 under at a certain point in time. But that had a lot to do with what was going on in the US, with very tight markets, hugely inverted futures markets. And, um, and obviously, that pushed uh, spot premiums to very low levels. Today, the US market seems to be comfortably supplied. Markets are in a carry. Rape, uh, canola oil is, uh, you know, they have their pathway into the US biofuel industry without any problem. And also, we're, they were having, we're seeing a huge influx of, uh, of waste oils, no? especially used cooking oil, which are also competing. So the US, at least for the, foreseeable future seems to be, you know, not the leader of a, of a rally in the markets, uh, but, and should not affect our, our premiums as, it, as they did in, in the past. Um, just as comment at the end, energy and vegetable prices are back to pre-Black Sea War levels. And, uh, you know, the question is, we, we lost demand when we went up. Will this bring back that demand uh, now when we're closer to or around $1,000, $1,100 levels. Unfortunately, we have this uh, crisis, no? this uh, macro crisis taking place, which uh, goes in the other direction. So um, that is you know, an open question. This is uh, a graph where we have um, the blue areas, uh, soybean oil production. 
the orange area is the domestic consumption for biodiesel, and uh, the gray area is domestic consumption for food. Um, and as you see, I don't know if does this one. It uh, the um, this year we're having the yellow line is basically the difference between the column and, and the area, and it's our exportable surplus. As you see, we have we're going to have the lowest exportable surplus in the last uh, 12 years. If we have a dollar scheme now in, say, 15 April or May, the farmer should push a lot of beans to the market, and probably we will be crushing at a rel relatively high rate during April, May, June. But in the second half of the year, our crushing rate will, will crash because we just don't have the beans. No? So we will be exporting a lot less oil. And this is a graph we pre started preparing many years for, for another reason, but I think it was interesting to share. The green and the red area represents the soybean oil premiums. Uh, and as you can see, you know, we were, you, this starts in 2014, is it? Yeah, January 2014. And, um, and then the lines, the yellow, the yellow line is uh, FOB Argentine prices, and the blue line is Chicago futures. So obviously the difference is represented in the, in the green and the red area. And it's just to illustrate, you know, what I mentioned earlier about the volatility uh, and, and the extremes that we have seen. You know, that ne never before have we seen markets move uh, I, I would say to the, uh, the level of overs we, we saw, you know, a year ago uh, and, and when, when the war in, in, in the Black Sea started and never before have we seen, uh, you know, levels of 2,000 under like we saw, you know, when futures were like 600 points inverted from one position to the next. And, you know, I think these kind of situations will continue. No? We, we will live with a lot of volatility in vegetable oil markets. This is the price evolution of the four major oils. So going back to, our, you know, what's going to happen with soybean oil, and uh, also previous speakers talked about it, uh, oil, all oils have been dropping lately, but uh, soybean oil prices are still higher than the other four oils. No? Amazingly, this year, rapeseed oil is, is extremely cheap in Europe. There's a, a huge availability. Uh, sun oil is uh, also extremely cheap. You see the, uh, the, the yellow line there. And, and cheaper even than palm oil. No? So it's, uh, this graph is, I think, until last Friday. I haven't included you know, the, the first two days of this week. But uh, you know, you can see you know how how that is pushing demand from soybean oil to to sun oil, especially in places like India, and probably will continue this way in, at least for for the next uh, three or four months. So to conclude, will be, will be crushing for vegetable oil. Uh, the U.S. will increase capacity big time, and uh, th that is a threat for our crushing industry, of course, uh, because as, as Tom said, they will be pushing their meal out and competing with, with our meal. Uh, but, you know, the, taking away this year where Argentina has suffered this, this incredible drought, as we go forward, the outlook is, uh, is, is not that, that gloomy for, for our crushing industry because uh, soybean production will recover and, and may start to increase again, uh, depending on what uh, the next government does, uh, especially with export taxes, which today punish soybean strongly versus uh, the cereals. We have 33% you know, for soybeans export tax versus, you know, around 10% for, for the grains. But also the sunflower seed crop is growing, as you see in the little graph there. Uh, this year we're, we're expecting over 4 million tons, 4.1 million tons in our case is what we're estimating, and that will continue to grow. 
And rapeseeds are starting to grow as well. Some of our competitors are, are starting to invest also in, in participating in, the, in, in this crop. Today, there are not many plants that can crush rapeseed in Argentina, but that could change. And as the world is basically going to crush for oil and not for meal, it would make sense that as we move forward, uh, prices take them, you know, drive, uh, they, should, they should be uh, that price spread between higher oil yielding oil seeds and beans should favor uh, planting of more of these uh, sunnies and, uh, and rape as well. And that should happen uh, as well in Argentina as we go forward. So, and rape seeds do not compete with soybeans. They compete with wheat. So, you know, you should have your 50 million ton soybeans plus, and we should have a growing uh, crop of, uh, of rape seeds and, and sunnies. So Argentina should continue to be, uh, and Brazil as well. Brazil is, uh, as the next speaker will, will let you know clearly, it has huge growth projected. So South America will continue to be your, your main source of, of soft oils for India and the rest of the world. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Well, I think the, the organization of the event uh, has been very wise and left Mr. Fulan Amaral from Brazil uh, to be the last one, so he can boast about his soaring uh, soybean crop because we were just suffering with the Argentinian one. You are welcome, Daniel. Thank you for, for having come down to Argentina, and uh, we, we are looking forward to your speech. Good afternoon. Well, um, vou tentar falar um, um pouquinho em espanhol. <laughs> uh, queria dizer que se uh, pensam que a ma ma maior rivalidade entre Brasil e Argentina é em soja ou carne, não é? É em futebol. Uh, é muito mais que qualquer outra coisa. É um histórico muito grande de juegos muy interesantes, eh, pero eh, año pasado eh, pienso que vi eh, el juego más, más emocionante de toda mi vida <risa> entre Argentina y Francia. Eh, eso causó una serie de problemas de salud en muchos brasileños, torciendo a favor o contra, <risa> en mi caso a favor. <risa> ¿No? Felicidades a todos los argentinos. Como mi, mi español está más para portuñol de que español, entonces voy a cambiar para inglés, por favor. Uh, so I'd like to talk about uh, our Brazilian soy complex, and I really thank you very much that uh, Andres, you could uh, anticipate some of my conclusions. And uh, put everything in a broad uh, framework, it's much easier uh, to explain. So I'd like to present some, some figures, some numbers about Brazil, uh, and some trends that I think uh, they are quite clear in Brazil, and uh, some, some others are not. So I'd like to share you what, what we think and how we can uh, uh, project some, some the 2023 and the upcoming years. Um, I'd like to start with this chart. Um, it, it shows how soybean oil is important for Brazil. Uh, over the, this last 20 years, uh, there was a lot of discussion in Brazil about uh, increasing other vegetable oils, other sources of oils and fats. But in fact, you can see that soybean oil was and still is the most important source of vegetable oil and for all raw materials in Brazil, um, more than 70%. And uh, probably that will increase uh, this share in the next years. 
Uh, although Brazil has a very important production, animal production for poultry, for swine, um, even bovine meat, you can see that this, the, uh, the, the extraction of these fats are very limited. So they, they are not intended for, for uh, fat production. They are intended for proteins. And the same happens with like a cotton seed. Uh, it, it's not intended for oil. The, the intention is uh, uh, the textile uh, industry. So what really uh, grew in Brazil was soybean oil extraction. And uh, that has, has a lot to do with uh, our biodiesel mandate uh, that since 2008 is uh, gradually been increasing. Even other oil, uh, other oil seeds such as rapeseed, sunflower seed, uh, they, they don't grow so as fast as we, we would like. Uh, it's very difficult to compete economically uh, when you have a system that you can produce soybeans plus corn in the same area. Uh, the return is much higher than other, other systems. So this is what is really happening and, and growing in Brazil. Soy and corn uh, all over the, the country. Even palm oil that we have uh, uh, available and without the deforestation land that was already deforested before 2006, you, you, it's difficult to see this production growing uh, as fast as we would like. So soybean oil uh, is in, for the short term, probably will be, will, uh, uh, be um, still the, the main source of vegetable oil. And I, uh, on purpose, I put this, this graph uh, uh, on, on the same scale of crop, crushing, and exports. And you can see that was uh, uh, um, an inversion of what happened in terms of the uses of soybeans in Brazil. Uh, the first year, we had 31 million tons of crop, but 21 million tons of crushing, and the other nine exported. In 2008, when the biodiesel mandate started with 2%, uh, we, had, uh, we harvested 60 million tons, and we crushed 32 and exported 24. So we still crushed more than 50% of our crop. To this year, 2023, we will harvest probably uh, 154 million tons, crush only 53. Uh, well, we increased a lot, but less, now we crush less than one, a little bit more than one third of our crop and the rest, the 92 million tons, uh, will be exported. And in Brazil, we think exports of soybeans are very good. We, 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 we think that's, that's uh, 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 something very positive. There is a lot of value added on, on soybeans. But there is a very long discussion in Brazil of how, how can we improve these numbers and crush more in Brazil. We discuss about logistics, we discuss about tax reforms, and uh, new, 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 new markets, international markets, but it's not something that we can change very easily. And uh, focusing on biodiesel mandate, uh, that can give us some, some answers of what we think we, uh, we should do in the, the next years. Uh, in percentage, you, can, you, you have the actual, the, the, the effective mandate that was applied in each year since 2005, when we started the, the, the voluntary mandate, 2008, the, the, uh, the, 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 the obligatory mandate. So you can see that it increased gradually, uh, except from 2022 when the government decided to reduce it to be 10, 10% due to an increase in soybean oil prices. But except for this year, all other years we, expect, we had a, a, a gradual increase. And today it was officially published. Uh, the, new, the new mandate uh, timeline for the next uh, four years. So starting with B12, 
this year in April, and for April of the next year's uh, B13, B14, and B15 2026. So that uh, uh, will demand much more soybean oil than we, we do now. For, for 2022, uh, about four and a half million tons of soybean oil were destined for biodiesel production. My number is a little bit different from uh, our national agency number because I estimate what, what uh, could be uh, of soybean oil in, in, a, in, a, in a raw material called by, by INEP as mixed vegetables and oils. So as this number is still significant, uh, we try to understand what could be there of soybean oil and other raw materials. So four and a half this year, uh, going to 7.6 million tons into 2026. For uh, other uses, especially for food, last year we had um, 2.7 uh, uh, million tons, um, and that will increase for uh, 3.8, uh, or sorry, uh, it, would, it should be uh, 3.6 this year, uh, last year and growing to 3.8, 3.9 million tons for other uses, especially food, but also starting uh, just this year for renewable diesel uh, from Petrobras. They are starting a new production of diesel uh, using uh, uh, soybean oil as raw material. So that uh, is another source of uh, biodiesel, uh, so of uh, soybean oil demand. Uh, for energy uses. And about exports, I think uh, Andres uh, uh, already answered that. Uh, last year we exported 2.6 million tons. Well, the industry expected much more uh, uh, biodiesel usage. That didn't happen as the government reduced the mandate. Um, but the international market was very open uh, for, for our exports. So we exported 2.6 million tons for this year, 2.2, and for the next years. Probably that will be much lower. I, I didn't even put the number there because I think that will depend a lot on crushing, on the evolution of the crushing of soybean. But probably that will be much smaller than we had seen, that we had seen on, over the last years. Uh, our opinion is that domestic consumption will be uh, will have a much important, much more important role uh, over this, this uh, next four years. To change that, we we really need, as uh, Thomas uh, said, uh, a different uh, market, uh, a growing market for soybean meal, either for consumption or exports. You can see that uh, from 2000, especially from 2003 to 2008, Brazil uh, uh, observed a, a very fast increase in domestic consumption of soybean meal. That was due to our uh, increase in purchase power. Uh, people could uh, consume much more um, poultry, uh, uh, swine, and other meats. Um, and also because we exported more. After that, two variables, they, 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 they had similar trends, and in the last two years, exports developed a, a more important role. So uh, that's what we, we expect to, to, to increase uh, uh, for the next years. So, but that will depend uh, on how our uh, main markets will behave. For Europe, we have seen uh, a relatively uh, stable uh, behavior. Uh, and for Southeast Asian countries, a uh, very fast uh, increase in, in consumption, uh, in imports. Uh, if you consider just European Union, Asia uh, already, already imports more of our uh, soybean meal than European Union. But if you consider all countries, all European countries as a whole, they, they still have a bigger market. But uh, when we see these trends, uh, our expectation if, is that uh, it uh, goes to the Asian markets. 
if, if they grow uh, as they are growing over the last four or five years, probably we will have uh, still some room to increase crushing and also to, uh, to, to, to consume more. In Brazil, we also expect that uh, our macroeconomic reforms revert in some kind of uh, an increase in GDP growth and also uh, an increase in consumption. But that's also to be seen. For soybean oil, uh, this is uh, our historical. You can see that uh, over the last two years, uh, exports to, to Asian countries, they increased uh, very, very fast, especially into 2022. We exported uh, a lot of uh, soybean oil uh, to India and Bangladesh. Uh, let's see if that will continue this year. Probably uh, they will keep uh, as a strong market. But as I said, we, we understand that the uh, local consumption will, will be more important for our industry. And just to finish, uh, and thank you again uh, at the invitation. Uh, I, I, I thank you in the name of Brazilian Association. It's always a pleasure to come here and to speak to you. Uh, our crushing has been increasing uh, over the last years. Uh, and we think that having uh, so much uh, soybeans being exported is, as op is an opportunity for Brazil to add more value. Uh, for the, the, the market for soybean oil, for us, is quite clear. The, the, the path is, is already uh, uh, there. Uh, but for soybean meal, it's a, still a challenge how we can uh, uh, sell all this soybean meal that will be generated for uh, uh, additional crushing. Um, we expect a strong demand for biodiesel and also for renewable diesel over the next years. Uh, we are still seeing some projects with uh, marginal uses of soybean oil, but are, are there are in the pipeline for 2027 um, entire plants, entire ref bio refineries to produce uh, HVO, to produce sustainable aviation fuels, uh, and other, and other uh, fuels that will require more soybean oil. Um, for soybean meal, as I said, it, it will depend on the international markets. We, we expect that these uh, sanitary agreements will open more markets, uh, and we expect also uh, our internal demand to recover. Um, but that's, that's uh, to be seen. For now, our expectation is that uh, uh, Brazil will, will reduce a little bit uh, our uh, exports of, so of soybean oil. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think this has been uh, the last uh, speech uh, for the day. Uh, we all hope that you, you have enjoyed and. Uh, uh, the, the day and uh, of course you are all welcome to the cocktail, the welcome cocktail that uh, Sierra is going to give uh, right now. Thank you for your presence and thank you for all the people that uh, we know that traveled long hours to, to be here with us and share with us uh, this couple of days. Uh, thank you all.